Sweet Garden Books. Whilst he does, no one can fall tonight. And good fellas take away fussy cost prices. Worth three pounds fifty each, now two pounds. Our Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Amen. <clears throat> My little experience of living in a farming community having lived in a semi-urban area for most of my life. Nevertheless, I can remember harvest time when children brought produce to a table at the front of the church and there was usually a display and perhaps with some bread in the shape of a sheep of wheat or a piece of coal with a piece of coal and a glass of water to remind us that we are dependent upon God for the physical harvest. But in days before machines, when, when before machines did most of the work, Harvest was a very labour intensive time. It was no doubt so in Israel in the time of Jesus' life on earth. The picture of the harvest is used in different ways in the Bible. Jesus uses the picture in the parable of the weeds in Matthew 13 to refer to his coming again to judge this world, where there will be a separation of those who believed in him and those who haven't, even within the visible church. But the harvest picture that Jesus uses here is that of a great number of souls to be gathered in and there is a need for labourers. Let us look at this as the plight of mankind, the pity of the Saviour. And so firstly, let's look at the plight of mankind. Jesus uses a different word picture here that of sheep. If you've ever driven across a moor like Exmoor, I suppose, or Dartmoor, where sheep roam freely, you know that they can suddenly run out in front of the car. Sheep are silly animals, aren't they? We sometimes say that people follow one another like sheep. But because they are such silly animals and prone to wander, they are also vulnerable. In these few verses, Matthew may have been summarizing Jesus' ministry in Galilee in the cities and the villages. And as he saw these people, he saw them as weary and scattered, as it's translated in the New King James Version, or in the ESV it re reads, harassed and helpless. And the reason they are like this is because they are like a sheep without a shepherd, a shepherd to lead and guide them, provide for them, and protect them. This is a description of all humanity. It is a description of you and me when we came into this world. We have a built-in proneness to go our own way. A verse I've often referred to recently is in Isaiah 53 verse 6a which tells us all we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to our own way. People may not realise this. They may think they are doing fine. I can manage my own ship. Perhaps it's only when something bad happens that we, we wake up to our need. Even then people, whether they're presidents or paupers, will say, I'm okay, I can handle this. Our pride doesn't like to admit our need. But whether we realise it or not, going our own way, will end in trouble. In fact, if we persist in it, then it will lead in that final separation from God. As Proverbs tells us, there is a way which is right unto a man, or seems right to a man, but the, that way ends in death. But God doesn't want us to remain in that situation, in that condition, 
He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but pe that people come to him in repentance and faith, and come to him and come to know him as a shepherd, a shepherd to guide them and uh, protect them and provide for them. And this is shown in the pity and the, and the, or the compassion of the Saviour. Dictionary different definition of compassion is a deep feeling of pity for the suffering of another and an inclination to give aid or support or to show mercy. Such is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is here there in verse 36, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. He saw their physical needs, their, their diseases and their afflictions, and he healed them. But even more, he was moved with compassion towards their spiritual needs. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd, going through life directionless, trying to find satisfaction in this life, in this or that. And he saw the plague of their hearts, as Solomon calls it, uh, that is the sickness of sin within each one of us. And it moved him to see how helpless we are. Of course, his holy heart was offended by our sinfulness, but he knew we need to come to that place of saying sorry and turning away from going our own way and putting our trust in him. But not only was he moved with pity for the effects of sin, in this world, disease and death, and the effects of our personal sin in our own lives, his love for mankind was to lead him to that death on the cross. Just as David, the shepherd boy in the Old Testament, put his life on the line to protect, to defend a few sheep from a lion and a bear, 1 Samuel 17 tells us. So the Lord Jesus voluntarily laid down his life for us. As John says in, in his gospel, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge have I received from my Father. And of course, it was also all part of God's eternal plan, even before the world was made, to send a saviour. And in that death of the Good Shepherd for us, us, those silly sheep who have gone our own way, we can have forgiveness and be made right with God. He will clothe us with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can then say, in the words of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But there is another way in which the Good Shepherd cares for those harassed and helpless sheep. And it's to that which I want to, tur to turn to now, the prayer for workers. In verse 38, Jesus says to his disciples, and of course he is speaking, to his 21st century disciples as well, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Or BSV has it, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. And as the chief shepherd looks out on this world in pity, he sees the great need of laborers to bring in the harvest. It's interesting that in the next chapter, Jesus calls the 12 apostles and sends them out on a mission. This, of course, only foreshadowed the great work they were called to do once he had ascended to heaven. The need is just as great today. Who is going to tell others about their desperate plight and the remedy God has provided? Let me tell you a story about a cobbler. In his cobbler's shop, he had a map of the world on the wall and he had been following with great interest Captain Cook's voyages in the South Seas. But his interest went deeper than just some geographical interest. He was concerned about the people in these places 
who had never heard that God had loved them. This, this cobbler eventually became a preacher, but his burden for people in other lands didn't go away. Things came to a head and he wrote a piece, as he called it, to answer the objections of those who were against world mission. Objections like this, but must not a second miraculous Pentecost precede and permit successful world missions? Or if God purposes to save the heathen, will he not step, take steps to effect it himself? Or, but we have task enough to engage us with the heathen at home. Well, in 1792, a group of ministers gathered together and now a cobbler delivered a message from Isaiah 54, verses two and three, which begins with these words, enlarge the place of thy tent. And in that message, he urged the case for world mission. Being a cobbler, he was used to working in pairs. And he had this famous saying, expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. And those words are in that order. His name was William Carey. He eventually went to India and he is known as the father of the modern missionary movement. What about us? Not many of us will probably go to a foreign country, though I mustn't limit what God can do in your life and in mine. We have a harvest field here to begin with. We may not be called to be a preacher or a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor or whatever, but each of us is unique. We have each different gifts or talents that God can use. And there is one important thing that we can all do. William Carey's story didn't end there. A society was formed to support him in his work. As William Carey went down into the deep mine of a venture into the unknown, that little group in this country held the ropes by prayer. Carey, as it were, said, well, well, I will go down if you will hold the ropes. Just as the Lord of the harvest, harvest needs labourers in his harvest field, so he needs those to hold the ropes in prayer for his workers. But as we conclude, let us remember it is the Lord's harvest. But note that lastly in the end of verse 38, it is his harvest. We must expect varying responses to the message of the gospel. Another parable that we often use at harvest time is the parable of the sower or the soils. It is in Matthew 13 and also in Luke and Mark. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark's account, do you understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? Mark 4 verse 13. So it was a key parable. We have the privilege of hearing Jesus' explanation to, to that parable. He says that there will be some whom the devil will soon snatch away God's word. There will be those who seem to receive the word with joy and last a little while, but when tribulation or persecution come on account of the word immediately, they fall away. There will be others who hear, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Surely that is a description of uh, the United Kingdom at this time when material things uh, become so important in people's lives. But there is one response which, that God looks for in your heart and in my heart. And it is this, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. So like William Carey, the labourers can sow in faith, believing that the Lord of the harvest will work in people's lives and bring forth fruit. Also, that parable of the sower 
is a reality check on where we, where we are. Why not turn to your Bible and find it in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 23, and take time to read it. Let's just finish now with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord God, that you are the Lord of the harvest, that you look into our hearts, you ask us to see where we are. Are we truly letting your word sink into the soil of our hearts? We pray that you would help us to listen to your voice, to, as you said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear and follow you. And so may the God's grace, may the love of God and the, f and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.